heard uh, such great things about this bumper video. Many of you have said you, you like it, and we got applause the first week we showed it, and I get it. It's funny, right? It, it's cute. Um, but does anybody else notice the injustice on the video? Anybody? Uh, Jane, can we throw up the, the picture here real quick of the RV? So what kind of weird science experiment here happened to Seth, Dan, and myself? Right? Our necks have been removed, our bodies filled up with helium, and our heads placed back on. We look like three Frankensteins riding on this bus, don't we? But wait a minute, who sits there looking just normal, happy as can be in the middle of the bus? Who is that, can anybody tell me? That's Rachel. Who do you think had the most creative control over the creation of this video? <laughs> who was that? It was Rachel, is that a coincidence? I don't think it is, look at her, she's happy. She's riding with three Frankensteins, nobody'd be happy on the bus. But. Anyways, and a lot of you are sending me texts, and I get it. I, I see the resemblance here. Um, I get it. <laughs> I see it. You don't need to tell me any longer. So um, anyways, I got, that, I got that off my chest. I verbally processed it. Still emotionally scarred, but I processed it. So we can move on now. Anyways, um, so we are, in the, uh, we are in our series, Summer Road Trip. We're ending the very first month of that. And I don't know uh, if you're like me, but when you hear the phrase Summer Road Trip, it automatically conjures up memories, right? Images of, of road trips maybe you've taken with your own family, uh, maybe road trips you took when you were a kid. Now, when I was a kid, uh, I was a child of the late 70s, early 80s, and my family didn't vacation a lot. But when we did vacation, we always drove because we just couldn't afford to fly. Um, so I thought I'd share with you some of our road trips. I'd share with you some pictures of from when I was a kid. Uh, here's a picture of me in Arkansas when I was really young. We were visiting friends. I'm not sure what's going on with the cowboy hat or the headless dog. He could ride the bus with the Frankensteins. Um, and then probably the picture I'm most embarrassed to show is this is me, uh, trolley car in San Francisco visiting our brother Dale in California. Let's just say the 80s were a horrible fashion period, right? Let's... <laughs> Let's just be honest. Now, when, when my family would take road trips, summer road trips, when I was really young, I was the last of eight. So we had a big car because we had a big family. And we had this big blue Pontiac station wagon. The best thing about that station wagon was the back seat. And that was called the rumble seat. Does anybody know what the rumble seat was? Yeah. So if you're under the age of 30, you probably did not raise your hand. Let me explain it to you. So the rumble seat was the very back row. And the coolest part about it, not only were you as far from your parents as you could be, but you faced backwards. And so you looked backwards out the car as you drove and the window went down. So you could be hauling down the highway as fast as you could go, window down. We didn't wear seatbelts back then. We could be dangling out the window, having a good old time. It's amazing we survived, but it was awesome. And actually, my favorite family road trip is when I was only five. And I know only five, I only have certain memories of it, but uh, my parents took my sister Amy and my uh, brother Darren, and we went down to visit my older brother Mike. He was working in Florida. He was working at a place that you've heard me mention a thousand times because it's the happiest place on earth. Where is that? It was at Disney. He worked at Disney. So this is my first Disney trip. This is five-year-old me right there. It's my brother Darren right here. And uh, I don't remember much about Disney. I got to be honest with you. What I remember about that trip was being on the road. It was the big blue station wagon. My brother Darren and I, we sit in that back rumble seat and we had a ball. Now, decades ago, you might remember this if you're older, it took days to get to Florida. The speed limits were different, right? The roads were different. So it was a multi-day experience. In fact, the journey was as much about the, uh, much of the vacation as the destination was. So we had a great time, but my favorite time and what I remember the most is when my dad would pop in an eight track tape. We had a in-dash eight track player, yep, state of the art. And he'd pop in Dolly Parton or Johnny Cash and Mac Davis. He loved that old country music. And my brother Darren and I, he remembers this as well. We would sing at the top of our lungs and do these motions. And we just had whole stories that went with each song. And if you're like me, one of my favorite parts of summer road trips with my family is family sing-alongs, right? Family sing-alongs are the best. So when Melissa and I had, had our kids uh, and we started our family road trips, we sang along too. A lot of Disney songs, classic 80s, classic rock. Um, and family sing-alongs are a big part of our summer vacations too. But if you've ever traveled with young kids, what's the worst part about family road trips? The complaining, right? Because the, the sing-alongs are punctuated by things like 
Are we there yet? I'm bored. She's looking at me. She touched me first. She's in my space. I got to go to the bathroom again and again and again and again. That's the worst part about family road trips. But then in the early 2000s, someone who, I don't know their name, but they're thanked by all of us for multi-generations, they developed this thing. It's called the low-cost portable DVD player. Do you remember when that came out? And you could suddenly strap screens to the back of your seats. You could plug in a movie. You could put in their headphones and wait for it. Silence. It was amazing. It was glorious silence for a second. Melissa and I could have adult conversations. We could listen to our music for a change. It was great. And as time went on, we bought a next minivan. It had a DVD player built into it. You could flip down the screen. We had wireless headphones, right? We were the Jetsons at that point in our lives. It was so cool. And then smartphones came out and and smartphones got smarter and smarter and smarter and tablets came out and suddenly all our kids had devices. And something interesting happened. That silence, that little bit of treasured silence that we once enjoyed, that seemed to get longer and longer and longer. But our family sing-alongs that we had, they seemed to get shorter and shorter and shorter. And and don't get me wrong, we have tried really hard when it comes to adopting technology in our families. My kids had devices years after their friends did, and we put time limits and boundaries on all of that. But one thing that I think is true for our family, and I think is true for you as well, is that as time has gone on, our technology today, right? Today's technology, today's fast-paced lifestyle, it's changed our definition of what we call family time, hasn't it? Right, with everybody having their own devices, accessible to things all the time, our jam-packed schedules of everything, it's changed how we spend time with our families. And so now when I'm driving down the road and I look in the rearview mirror, I see my kids and they're each on their own devices, listening to their own songs or movies or playing their own game, and it's a little bit isolated now. But it's not just in the car, because you can go out to restaurants, and what do you see? You see families sitting around a table, all glued to their own devices, not saying a word to each other. I see young couples, whether they're married or dating, I don't know, but they're on a date together, and they're not even talking. They're just staring at their phones. I've even seen parents give toddlers devices to keep them quiet so they can look at their phones again. And it's not just in public, because in private, in our own homes, did you know that 40% of families say they only have three meals together a week or less? 10% of families don't have a meal together at all throughout the week. And it's not about family sing-alongs, right? Because you can sing off tune anywhere you want to go. And it's not about eating together at a regularly timed schedule. We all know that spending time together is about creating opportunities, creating opportunities for conversation, creating opportunities for communication, because that's the key to relationships. And, and we know this. This is, this is not rocket science, right? This isn't new to any of you. This is like being human 101. We have to take the time, whether it's parenting or whether it's in your marriage or dating relationship, whether it's with your family, your friends, you've got to find time away from everything else, away from distractions where you can engage in communication and conversation because that's what builds healthy relationships over time. And when I look now, it just doesn't seem like we're doing that anymore. It doesn't seem like we're all making that time. In fact, kids, I'm going to let you in. What, teenagers in the room, raise your hand. I'm not going to pick on you. If you're a teenager, raise your hand. You, you ma'am, are not a teenager. Oh, that's, not, that's so. I just called Isaac with his big hair a man. That is uh, that was bad. I'm gonna edit that out of the video. All I saw was the afro. I'm so sorry for that. Let's recompose. Can we go back and start this over and just retape the whole thing? <laughs> <laughs> all right, now teenagers, raise your hand again, and I'm not going to look. I'm not going to look at Isaac. Um, all right, so if you're a teenager, I'm going to give you a parenting secret for teenagers that we don't tell anybody, right? This is something you may not know. Your parents may not have tipped you off to this. Here's the deal. Um, we don't actually care about the origin stories of your favorite superhero or your video game characters. We don't. We're not interested in those. And guess what? That song that you're playing for us, that you say this is your favorite song, 
I can't tell the difference between the last song you played for me. All your music sounds exactly the same to us. And I got lost hours ago in your story about a friend who had a friend that was talking about your friend, and now they're not friends anymore because they were talking about your friend. I don't get it. I'm not there. But here's the thing, teenagers. I do care and I don't. Because what we care about as parents when you're a teenager is that you're actually talking to us. We care that you're sharing your life with us. We want to have a dialogue, an open dialogue between us, no matter how uncool we may seem as parents. And we know this when it comes to parenting. We know this when it comes to our marriages or any other relationship. But, you know, as G.I. Joe would say at the end of every single episode, knowing's only half the battle. And that's the half of the battle we get right, is knowing. We don't always put it into practice. A lot of times we're not creating the space and the time for conversations. And this is important, right? We all know it's super important in everyday life. But did you know that it's even more important when it comes to your faith? Did you know that conversations and communication with you and the next generation, those younger than you, is super important when it comes to your faith journey and even more important when it comes to their faith journey? Now, as I've gotten to know a lot of you and spent time with you, most of you have told me that You've got a burden for someone in your family or for a friend because you're not sure where their relationship with God is. Maybe it's a, a, it's a kid, maybe it's a grandkid, it could be a parent or a brother or sister, could even be your spouse, and you're not sure where they stand in terms of their relationship with Jesus. You're not sure uh, how they're living their life or if that's the best way to live their life. If you've got young kids here today and you're a Jesus follower, my guess is that you're concerned about where your kids are going to be in terms of their relationship with God in a year from now or five years from now or 10 years from now. Because here's what most of us want. We want to pass on a legacy of faith, right? That's a burden for most of us. We want to pass on a legacy of faith, whether it's to our kids or grandkids or the next generation and so on and so on. But that's hard to do because you can't make the decision for someone else to follow Jesus. That's their decision. Salvation's not genetic, but as followers of Christ, whether you're a mom, dad, grandparent, brother, sister, friend, whatever that is, it gets even harder when we lose our ability to communicate, when we lose our ability to have conversations. And so we're going to look at, with the rest of the time we have this morning, we're going to look at a passage out of the book of Deuteronomy. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 6. If you have your Bibles, you're welcome to turn there with me. I'll have it up on the screen so we all can follow along. Now, we covered Deuteronomy or another passage in the very end of Deuteronomy about a month ago. So I'm very, very quickly going to give you some context before we jump into the passage. So the book of Deuteronomy, the entire book, is basically a big, long speech or message from this guy named Moses. And God had called Moses to lead the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, his people, out of Egypt where they were slaves. He was leading them to a land that he was going to give them called the Promised Land. But because of the nation of Israel's own disobedience and unbelief that God would actually give it to them, they, they ended up wandering around for 40 years in the desert. And so the book of Deuteronomy, this big long speech from Moses, this is literally right before they're going to cross into the land. It's been a long time coming. And when I read Deuteronomy, when I read the speech, it, it's almost like a, a message coming from not just a leader, but a leader who cares for his people. Someone who wants what's best for his people, wants to know that their future will be good. Almost like a parent or a grandparent. So we're going to jump into chapter 6, starting in verse 1. Here's what Moses says. He starts out, These are the commands, the decrees and laws, the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. Now, in, in chapter 5, right before this, what Moses had gone through was the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments God had given to the nation originally uh, in the book of Exodus. And that was the backbone and the foundation of how God wanted them to live in this new land. Now, why did he give them to them? Well, Moses says, so that you, he gave them to you so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you. And so that you may enjoy long life. 
We talked a few weeks ago about God's rules of the road, and he gives us the rules of the road. He gave the nation of Israel the rules of the road, not to keep them from having fun. He doesn't give us principles in life to live by to control us or keep us from having a good time. He gives them to us so that we can enjoy a long life. And right away, Moses says that, hey, these things, the way God wants you to live, that's not just for the adults in the room, right? This isn't just for those of us that are older listening. It's also for our children and their children. And you would assume, and so on, and so on. These principles are for the next generation and the next generation after them. Moses goes on in verse 3, and he says, Hear, Israel, listen, pay attention to this. Be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and so that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Now, in this verse, Moses is giving us two commands when it comes to the principles of God. The first one is just to hear, to listen, to know, right? We need to know how God wants us to live. For us today, that means reading the Bible. It might mean coming to church and listening to a message or being part of a small group. We need to know how God wants us to live. But then it's not enough to know. Just like we talked about, we need to be careful to obey it. God wants us not just to know it. He wants us to put it into action. And the reason he gives us these principles and the reason he gave the nation of Israel these principles is so they could prosper in the land that they were about to enter. For us today, we live by his principles so that we can enjoy a life the way he designed it, the way God has intended us to live. And Moses goes on, verse 4, and he says, Hear, says it again, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, these commands that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Now these first two verses, verse 4 and verse 5, these would live on to actually be central to the Jewish faith. In fact, for those that follow Judaism today, these are still central to their faith. They're known as the Shema. The Hebrew word is Shema, and it literally is the word, Hebrew word for here, Shema. And the Jewish folks back then and still today, this would be part of their daily prayers. And they wanted to be focused around two key principles. First one is that the Lord is one. That our God, the God of the Bible, Yahweh, as opposed to all the other faith systems and belief systems of that day and even today with their many gods and many goddesses, our God, Yahweh, is just one. And then the second key principle is that we're to love him with all our heart, and with all our soul, which is basically everything that we're made of, everything inside us, and with all our strength. So to our greatest effort, with all the might that we have, we're supposed to love God. In fact, thousands of years later, when Jesus was asked what the most important commandment in all the law, the Jewish scriptures was, he pointed back to this verse. He said, love the Lord with all your heart and soul, everything you are. That's the most important command. But then in Matthew 22, he actually adds something to that. He says, the second is like it, that we need to love our neighbor as ourself. In fact, Jesus would say, the law and the prophets, which is most of the Old Testament, it all hinges on these two things, loving God with all that we are and loving our neighbors as ourselves. In fact, you could say, this is the greatest rule of the road. It's actually a 1A and a 1B. Rule 1A, love God with all that you are. Love him with everything inside us and to all our effort and strength. Rule 1B, love everyone else as yourself. That is the core of Christianity. In fact, if you think back to any sermon you've ever heard, any message you've listened to, any Bible study you've done before, everything basically that you strive for if you're a Jesus follower, it boils down to these two things. Putting God first in our life and then loving others. In fact, Christ would teach later that we're to love others as he loves us. But it also... All of our struggles boil down to these two things as well, right? We struggle with putting God first in our life, with prioritizing him. We struggle with loving others with that same grace-filled, self-sacrificing love that he showed us. It's kind of ironic, really, because Jesus would say that this is the core of Christianity, but our ups and downs in our faith journey, our forwards and backwards, it revolves around our ability and inability to do these two things. But just like he said before, these commands, this greatest rule of the road, it wasn't just for us. It wasn't just for the adults in the room. Moses would continue and he would say, impress them 
on your children. Impress them on your children. Who's responsible for making sure that our kids know who God is and how he wants us to live? Well, we are. In fact, the inference here in this sentence is a lot more personal than we. It actually means for myself, for those people who are younger than I am in my sphere of influence, who has responsibility to teach them about God and how he wants them to live? I am. In your sphere of influence, those younger than you, who's responsible to teach them about God and how to live? Well, you are. And your translation might not say impress, it may say teach or teach diligently, but I love that word impress because it, it means like we're not just teaching or talking at or giving someone the what for, we're actually making an imprint, a lasting imprint on someone's life. And in case there's any, any uh, question as to when do we teach our kids about God, when should we talk to the next generation about faith, well, Moses answers that for us. He keeps going in the verse and he says, talk about them, the ways of God, who God is, Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road. So when you're at home together as a family, when you're out and about together as a family, which is pretty much saying any place is a great place to talk about God. And then he says, when you, when you lie down and when you get up, so basically when you're getting ready for bed and then when you first get up in the morning, which is basically saying any time's a good time to talk about faith. And why is that? Well, because life... Life is always a teachable moment, isn't it? Life itself is always a teachable moment. Now, my family's a homeschooling family. We've always homeschooled our kids. And if you've ever homeschooled or you're homeschooling your kids today, this is like homeschooling number one, right? Because we can't just go to the zoos. That's a biology uh, exam. We can't just make dinner. That's a lesson on fractions and measures. Life is always a teachable moment when you're a homeschooler. But it couldn't be more true when it comes to our faith. Right? Who you run into that day, what happens to you throughout the day, a news story you're watching on TV, a sitcom you're watching, a fender bender in rush hour. That's an opportunity to talk about God and to talk about faith. But it's, it's not just about conversations either, right? Because if you're a parent, you know this as far as your actions. You can't get away with do as I say and not as I do for so long, right? Your kids are going to call you out on that. You can talk about God, you can verbalize we should have them as a priority, but a lot of times your actions speak louder than words. And so Moses goes on with this next verse. It's a little bit difficult to understand at times, but he goes on and he says, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. What is he talking about there? Do, do we literally need to take scripture and tie it to our hands or wear something between our eyes with the commands of God on it? Well, believe it or not, in ancient Judaism and still in Judaism today, there are some who have worn scripture on their hands or bound them on their arms, or they would wear these boxes and put them in the middle of their heads. But I don't think that's what he was talking about. I don't think we need to take Moses literally all the time because he just talked about a land flowing with milk and honey. And if you had streams of honey and milk running through your property, it'd be disturbing, right? So I think what Moses is referring to when he says, tie them on our hands, he means everything we do through our action, through what we're doing through the day, we need to put our words, our thoughts into action. And when we bind them on our foreheads, it's not just about having them on our heads. It's about having them front and center in our lives. It's about having them as part of everything we look at. Because guess what? What you look at is what enters your thoughts. Moses goes on and he says, write them on your door frames of your houses and on your gates. Again, not literally, but your house, your foundation, the foundation of your home life, the foundation of how you build your family, the foundation of your community as far as your gates, they should be built on God, the principles of God, the ways of God, and how he wants us to live. Because here's the thing, when, when you have your family and your life focused on God and his ways, when that's what's first and foremost in your life and all that you do and what you say, that's when conversations of faith happen with the next generation. That's when we have open communication about how God wants us to live. And that's when we can pass on a legacy of faith. So for those of you in here that are, are parents or grandparents or aunt uncles or an older sibling or play any role in someone's life that's younger than you, that's all of you. Nobody is exempt for that, by the way. Let me ask you this question. How are you doing with it, right? How are you doing with having real conversations about God 
and faith with someone younger than you? You don't know? That's a good answer. I think for a lot of us, we don't know. Yeah? How are you doing with conversations about who God is in your life? Who He is? How He wants you to live? Talking about the principles first and foremost, how He called us to live. I think it's tough. I mean, I think just like technology and schedules getting in the way of our everyday life, just like summer road trips with our family sing-alongs, I think we've lost the art of good old-fashioned communication. And I think that's putting the next generation at a disadvantage, not just in life in general, but I think it's putting them at a dangerous disadvantage when it comes to our faith. Coming to know who our God is and how he expects us to live, his principles which will help us live a long life. And so I've got a challenge for all of us. During this summer, um, just something that we can focus on so that we can help pass on a legacy of faith. And the first part of the challenge is this. The first part of the challenge is to create opportunities for conversations. Create opportunities where you can have good old-fashioned just talking with someone else. When's the last time that you put down your phone or turned off your device, turned off the game or TV, When's the last time you looked at your schedule and said, my schedule's so jam-packed, I don't have good time to spend with those that I love? And it doesn't have to be designated time. It just could be time doing anything, right? It could be time playing a game together, taking a hike together, just hanging out together. The key ingredient to conversations and communication is really just you and being engaged. Create the opportunities for conversations. And then second... Use those opportunities and be intentional with using conversations to talk about faith, right? Because life is always a teachable moment. Anything that's happening throughout your life, anything that comes up as a subject can tie to God and faith. Let me ask you, uh, parents or grandparents, for your kids and grandkids, how many of them know your faith journey? How many of them know how you came to know Jesus as your Savior? Maybe know what your life was like before you made that decision. Or I'll give you a harder one. How many of your kids or grandkids know your biggest struggles? Maybe the sins that you've struggled with the most in life, the scars that you bear that you're hoping that they never will. Do they know your strength areas? Do they know where you get inspiration? Do they know your hopes? I know those are hard conversations, but transparency when it comes to faith and the ways of God is so good Be intentional about talking about God and faith. And then lastly, when you have these conversations, make it a discussion, right? Not a lecture. Because a discussion is not you giving them the what for or telling them how it's going to be. You need to create a safe place for the younger generation to express doubts, to ask questions, to talk about what they're struggling with, to talk about where they are on their faith journey. I mean, let them be honest. parents in the room, if you have kids downstairs today in Kid Connection, when you pick them up each Sunday, ask them what they learned. Ask them what they learned that day and then talk about what does that mean for your life. You need to make it age appropriate, I get that, but ask them what they learned. Or if you have teenagers in the room, parents, blow their mind today when you get in the car, say, what did you think of John's message? It doesn't matter if they agreed or disagreed with me, listen to them. Teenagers, if you want to blow their mind, listen and actually give an opinion. Tell them what you think. Have a good conversation. And the last thing I'll leave you with on that point is when you're having a conversation with the next generation, be prepared because God usually has something for you in that conversation. We don't think about it that way, but often it's been in the innocence of a child or the hard to answer question of a third grader that God teaches me something or the bluntness of a teenager or young adult. He always has something for me in those conversations as well. And so this is a challenge I want to leave you with as part of our summer road trip this summer is to be intentional to create opportunities to talk about faith, whether it's your children or grandchildren, anyone younger than you. Because the legacy of faith, we own that. That is our responsibility. And it's a challenge that I don't think we can pass on. Would you pray with me?